All right. Before we go any further, let's just pause a moment. We have about 30 minutes. And you made a commitment to be on this call. So I really encourage you to give yourself the opportunity to dive into the topic, walk away with some learnings and tools that you can use on the job, but also in your day-to-day -day interactions with people. So just take a moment to settle in. I'll do the same. Maybe even take a deep breath and do whatever you need to do to be focused and present. So close your email, put your phone on vibrate, Another easy one is to maximize the webinar on uh, full screen to minimize distractions. That's right. That's right. Thank you, Alyssa. And just a couple quick things about the GoToWebinar dashboard. We recommend that you connect via computer audio, but if you have issues with that, you can always dial in via phone. We will be asking you a few questions today, so take a moment to locate the questions area so you know to, where to go uh, to respond. And we only have 30 minutes today, so we won't be doing a Q&A, but we will keep track of your questions and we'll address them after the session. Okay. Let's take a look at what you can expect. So our topic today is thriving. Not just surviving, but thriving in a virtual world with a focus on closing that gap in cultural communication. And we're going to call, cover cultural dexterity, your own cultural preference, preference and adjusting your style, a couple of easy to use tools, and then you'll create an action step or two. As you listen today and participate, choose one or two key concepts that you can take back into your life. Um, and, you know, use it work or outside of work and take notes about them or take a screenshot, uh, use your phone to take a photo. We are recording the session and we will get that to you in the next few days. Okay, so Sean, should we take a moment to turn our cameras off and then introduce ourselves? Right. Yeah, good. why don't you later. start? Oops. Okay. There we go. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. Thank you for that, Alyssa. Uh, again, my name is Sean uh, DeBurk, and I live in New York, where, I, where I've been with RW3 since 2008. I'm delighted to be co-presenting co with Alyssa today, who I met years ago as we began to partner with Crown to bring culturaltraining.com to many of you in service of developing the global skills we're sharing with you today. In my role, I lead the learning practice at RW3 to help professionals navigate their work across cultures, along with producing research and strategies for high-performing virtual collaboration. I myself come from a family of newcomers to the US. My father is from Germany and my mother's family are from Italy and Cuba. So there was a lot of confusion for me growing up, which I later discovered was a result of the now obvious cultural value differences. So I've learned the hard way how important it is to apply the sorts of intercultural skills that we're talking about today. Again, it is an honor to be with you all. Thanks, Sean. So everyone, I'm Alyssa Bantel, the Senior Program Manager for Crown's Global Skills Team. Probably everybody on this call knows Crown World Mobility is a full service provider of relocation services. And the Global Skills Team is within that and it develops and delivers skill building training, coaching programs to support employees and their families on their international assignments. And I'm in my seventh year of living in Miami after having lived and worked in Italy, Japan, and Germany for over 10 years. And um, actually, I'm also a first-generation uh, American, so Sean, I, I understand what you mean about learning by doing when it comes to culture. So that's who we are. Now, what about you? So looking at the registration list, I saw that we have a really diverse group on the call. And who are you all? Well, you work in mobility, you work at Crown, you've recently relocated internationally, or maybe we're just about to. So in other words, we have relocating employees and their spouses or partners on the session. And just a quick note that since that's a little bit of a mouthful to say, we do have limited time. We'll use the more general term assignees today. Oh, and some of you just want to learn more, and we love that. Okay, everyone, I'd like to take you through a quick activity right now. Ready? All right, here we go. What I'd like you to do is 
to cross your arms. Just cross your arms and notice how that feels. Okay. Now cross your arms the other way. And I'll give you a few extra seconds for that. And once you've crossed your arms the other way, really notice what that feels like. Okay, now you can keep your arms crossed, but you can choose whichever way you want. The first way, the second way. <laughs> All right, now you can uncross them. So let's talk about that a second. I bet that when you crossed your arms the first time, it was pretty natural and easy. But then crossing your arms the opposite way probably took a bit more thought. Maybe some of you even had to look at your arms. And keeping them crossed that opposite way probably felt awkward and uncomfortable. So I'm guessing most of you probably went back to that first way of crossing your arms once you had the choice. So this simple exercise is a great way to show us that we tend to have a preference that shows up in our habits and we naturally tend to stick to those habits. Those habits help us get through large portions of our day on autopilot, which is great. And they leave our energy and concentration free for things like problem solving. So even doing something that seems simple, but slightly different, will require more effort, concentration, and basically increase your stress level. And it's hidden stress. This unfamiliarity is normally associated with assignees, but I think we're all there right now. What do assignees typically experience? Well, they find themselves in a new country needing to create a whole new life for themselves. And sure, the employee has some continuity with work, but nothing's really the same. And the partner or spouse, on the other hand, doesn't have that support structure and needs to create one from scratch for him or herself, along with a daily routine. And yeah, they have technology like video calls, which gives them access to family and friends. But honestly, it's not at all like being face to face. And of course, there's so many unknowns, language, systems, norms. Some unknowns were expected, but others, well, you know what they say, you don't know what you don't know. Any of that kind of sound familiar to those of you who are not assignees, but just dealing with the challenges of interacting virtually and living day after day with all sorts of unknowns? And it's just like, um, and just like assignees, you probably find yourself still needing to problem solve, still needing to perform at 110%, but you have less energy and focus to do so. So I really think this is a unique moment where we have a lot in common, assignees and non-assignees, and there's a lot to learn from this. All right. So I have a question that I'd like to ask everyone, uh, and we'd like you to go to the questions area to, to respond to this question that you can see here. What are your remote or virtual collaboration challenges. Go ahead and share those uh, so we can get a sense for what you are experiencing. I'm gonna read some of those out loud. And um, okay, I'm seeing some folks typing in, language barriers are always tough, hard to understand people who are non-native speakers. Yep, yep, people talking over each other. Okay, time zones, definitely. One person saying that even if I ask people for their input, there are so many challenges with people talking over each other. Yeah. Working virtually, missing the body language. That's a really, really good one. And people being more short with their answers and their responses in general. Yeah, it feels like there's less space for us to do what we do in a normal face-to-face -face environment. Establishing trust with managers. Definitely hard to, to establish trust in a virtual environment. It's actually one of the central focuses that we're taking today. So thank you very much for, for weighing in, everyone. I'd like to just say that a lot of your challenges align really well with what we've seen over the past 10 years in studying these issues. In 2018, RW3 cast its fifth global and virtual team survey, 2,000 responses from folks across 90 countries, and the results illustrated a lot but only 22% of those people ever received any form of learning on virtual teamwork. So we all need some guidance. On this slide, you can see a whopping 86% of respondents chose both communication and building relationships as a top issue on their virtual teams. Take a look at the other things on this list, but 
we will be providing a few best practices focused on those two areas a bit later on. I'd like to read a quote that we included in the report. As human beings, we are endowed with multiple senses and forms of expression that we rely on in our interpersonal communication. When deprived of that sensory input and unable to express ourselves, we must find a way to compensate. And in the virtual world of work, we are certainly robbed of that sensory input when we are, that we get when we're interacting with people face to face. So, you know, we can read words and emails on our devices, but we're not hearing the person's tone of voice and we're not observing the person's facial or nonverbal expressions. So of course a webcam, that's the obvious solution, right? But still our webcam technology pales in comparison to the real thing. So the question is, how do we make our virtual interactions more human in order to compensate for what's missing? We also want to highlight the fact that today, all of us work across cultures, even if you don't think you're working across cultures, upon closer examination and with the insights and the tools that we provide you today, you'll discover work style differences that distinguish you from your peers. Even though you might have the same passport, you might live in the same city, cultural diversity is everywhere, which is why we brought in this quote uh, from a book that the founders of RW3 wrote. So we're building towards a big idea, which we're going to bring up now. Exactly, Sean. And this is where that concept of cultural dexterity comes in. It's a great skill to develop for assignees and honestly, every one of us right now. It helps us overcome the magnified challenges of working virtually and across cultures. So you see here, there are three components. The first is observing an interaction actively with awareness and curiosity. Sean will talk to you more about that in the next few slides. So the second part, pausing and looking deeper so you can interpret that person, the situation more accurately. And lastly, shifting your behavior to have a greater impact. So yeah, it's, you know, it's always, always good to start building cultural dexterity by just first paying attention to your own work styles. With more self-awareness, it'll be easier to see how other people may be similar or different, and it'll be easier to approach those differences with a non-judgmental perspective that allows you to more productively respond. Now, we do have an assessment that we'll discuss later on to help you jumpstart the process of learning more about your values and how they translate to your work style. The other key to developing this is to actively observe and inquire about the people that you work with. Now, some people like to say curiosity killed the cat, but I say that curiosity is what we need to learn how to be better at global business. Of course, there are culturally appropriate ways to be curious and to ask questions that allow you to be curious without getting into trouble. So there is a certain art to being curious, that's, that's a given. But the other part about being curious is that it demonstrates a level of humility to other people, demonstrates that there are limits to your knowledge base, and that by asking people to share, you invite them to tell you what matters most instead of assuming that you're on the same page. And we know how much trouble that gets us into, especially for those of us living internationally or have relocated internationally. We simply don't know what we don't know, but by dialing up the volumes of curiosity, you can get to the insight that you need to thrive no matter where you are. And we have a tool to help you get into this space that Alyssa will explain. Hmm, I love that. As Sean mentioned, I wanna share a tool with you. Um, it might remind you of the components of cultural dexterity, and that's exactly right. It's the application of those components. So its purpose is to get us out of that surface level reaction mode that you see there on the top. We usually perceive something, interpret quickly, and then react. This process on the bottom interrupts that habit. By asking you to actually observe, use that curiosity and awareness that Sean just talked about, insert a pause to look deeper at the situation and the people involved, and then interpret so that we can act instead of react. So this is one easy way to remind yourself to use cultural dexterity. I'll share another tool with you shortly. But first, Sean, what's the connection with workplace diversity? Yeah, that's a good question. Without a view to what's beneath the surface or without the lens to see work style diversity for what it is, it's hard to evaluate others' intentions, making it even harder to respond productively. 
understanding this work style diversity is essential to being effective in a, in a global or otherwise diverse environment. So we'd like to invite you to generate your own personal cultural profile using culturaltraining.com. You simply respond to 40 items that gauge your work style preferences, it takes about 10 minutes. Afterwards, you'll see a profile that looks like what you can see on this screen here, which shows where you land across eight dimensions of culture. And then you can compare yourself with the cultures of over 160 countries, giving you insights and strategies to help you bridge those differences that may keep you from being effective, while also showing where you have things in common. Mm, Sean, if I can just add a few things here from the Crown perspective. Um, we use this tool in all of our trainings and really have a great response to it, as you know. It drives self-awareness, really helps people to understand what they are experiencing, and then how to shift behaviors in an interaction. So to everyone in this session, many of you have used culturaltraining.com. Some of you might have used another cultural dimension tool. And some of you maybe have never used a cultural profile tool like this. And we just want to reassure you that the principles that Sean's about to cover will make perfect sense regardless. And you can apply them right away when this session is over. Ah, and um, a quick reminder to all Crown employees, don't forget you have unlimited access to culturaltraining.com. The information is on the Global Skills SharePoint site. So remember a moment ago when I mentioned another tool? Well, this is it. And it takes that same concept of observe, pause, interpret, act, and it looks at it through a slightly different lens, the lens of style shifting. So when you're in a situation or an interaction, it can be professional, it can be social, what you do, you observe your preference and then the other person's, and then you shift your approach. So it's important to note that even a really subtle shift can make a big impact. This is, a, this is an approach that will work really well with the value dimensions that Sean is about to share with you. But first, I think it's time for you guys to do some work. So Sean has a scenario for you to consider. That's right, that's right. Let's get, let's get to work here, everyone. So let's take a look at a situation to help you gauge your preference when it comes to the levels of directness with which you communicate. So imagine that you and a team member have been collaborating for a while on a project and there are several things you feel need to change with regards to how you work together. What would you tend to do in this kind of situation? Think about where you are on this continuum that you see up towards the bottom of the slide. And you might not be at one extreme or another, but think about how you would react in this situation. On the indirect side, would you refrain from telling them something if you believe it will cause disagreement because disagreement could ruin your working relationship? Or on the direct side, would you tell them your thoughts and opinions more directly, even if it causes disagreement because you believe that working through it, you'll improve your relationship? Now, I recommend that you just go with your first preference or reaction to this situation. That's going to more closely align with your value uh, for communication. And of course, there's many other ways to respond to the situation, but we're illustrating potential response patterns based on the general attributes of people who value indirect and direct communication. So let's take a look at communication style diversity more closely. Uh, as a dimension of culture, communication forms part of the framework that we use on culturaltraining.com to guide professionals through their cross-cultural interactions. And communication obviously speaks to an individual's beliefs about what is good communication, the best ways to share opinions, the levels of directness and context that we use and expect from others. So again, I wanna ask you, where do you think you land on this dimension? And we encourage those of you with access to culturaltraining.com to go and complete the assessment so you can get a more accurate sense for where you are. But I've highlighted the top two bullets to show how indirect communication individuals send messages in more subtle and often diplomatic ways, factoring in the face, or reputation of the recipient of their messages, while on the other hand, direct communicators say what they mean and mean what they say. There's a strong value for debate and even confrontation in the face of a disagreement. So how does all of this play out in your virtual interactions where there is a lack of visual stimuli making it even harder to understand the communication styles of your peers and managers and so on and so forth? So let's move on to a challenge related to communication uh, where 
in this case, we're highlighting the challenge where direct communicators, perhaps also the native speakers on your virtual meetings, tend to dominate discussions and voice their thoughts much more than indirect or non-native speakers who may have a hard time jumping into conversations. There's an opportunity here for managers to coach those direct individuals to appreciate the importance of pausing, allowing for silence, which may give indirect folks a window to jump in. You can also suggest these more direct folks share their thoughts via chat or in writing instead of interrupting, which causes you know, a lot of frustration that we will experience on conference calls. Managers can also coach indirect or non-native team members to be better at voicing their ideas during virtual meetings where we know it's all too easy to hide. Now, you might engage the indirect folks that you want to hear from by giving them safe speaking roles to help them practice voicing, like reading through the agenda or kicking off a meeting with a simple message. And of course, you can always prep those individuals with a one-on-one, -on -one, a pre-meeting, to help them work through what they plan to say. Now, the idea here is to get creative with the awareness that you build around the individual work style preferences of your specific team members and colleagues so that you play to their specific value for communication. So let's switch things up and move into one further situation for us to analyze. This one's focused on relationships. So again, imagine that you are meeting with a new vendor partner for the first time via video conference. Your first step is to establish a timeline for your joint project. So how do you approach this call? Again, take a look at the potential responses along the spectrum on the left side, the interpersonal side. I don't use an agenda and instead approach the call as a meet and greet, where what matters most is getting to know the other person. If we have time for business, we discuss that at the end of the call. On the other side, I send an agenda in advance asking for the person's agreement to discussing key project variables and co-create a timeline to send to our managers for their review and approval. So we've got two very different approaches here. Again, which side would you lean towards? And do you have experience with people that exhibit these styles? So let's take a deeper dive into the relationships dimension. And interpersonal cultures tend to believe that strong interpersonal business relationships are the key to success, and getting to know people as people, not just as working professionals, is a big part of that. Transactional cultures tend to emphasize the completion of their tasks as the key to demonstrating their trustworthiness and to building good professional relationships. This isn't to say that transactional people don't care to learn about personal details, but that they prioritize the completion of their work before getting to interpersonal topics. And interpersonal people prioritize in reverse more or less. So as you may have guessed it, the last challenge here is how to balance between these two clashing styles. And in my experience and also from the research, we find that when we work virtually, many, many people tend to give less time to the human side of things or the interpersonal side of things. So even people who are naturally more interpersonal, they even may throw that out the window because of the lack of visual stimuli on virtual meetings. It's easier to be interpersonal when you're sitting in front of someone, which we're just not doing right now. So it's vital for all of us to remember that folks on the other end of the phone or webcam are living out their lives, and by virtue of sharing more than less information on the interpersonal side of things, you can actually develop what we might call a sort of virtual closeness. Typically, the best practices are all about balancing between informal, friendly conversation alongside the more task-focused or project-related discussions. It's really important to do simple things like share pictures of yourself, of your family even. It's important to prepare yourself and your home office or wherever you may be to use your webcam. And during these particularly challenging times to bring some levity to the conversation, excuse me, to the conversation by sharing what's interesting, what's comical, what's inspiring about working from home or working remotely. One of my colleagues has a two-year-old and he sat on his lap during a recent web meeting, which was very cute, but we could say hi, and we had a visceral understanding of, wow, this is how life for him is at home with his family. But so many of us are uncomfortable being on webcam, so I just suggest that you play around with the levels of formality that you can apply to different meetings to take the pressure 
off people to look their best, for example. It's obvious that we're all working from home, so maybe we can adjust the webcam dress code a little bit uh, to, to suit ourselves right now. So I hope I haven't overloaded you with too many ideas. We wanted to give you a range to work with to develop cultural dexterity, to focus on communication and relationships. We know how challenging it is. And we also touched on some really concrete insights and these strategies that we hope you'll start using to be more effective in your multicultural and also virtual work and maybe even life in general. Thanks, Sean. Yeah, I love that. A lot of great best practices. And I agree, we've covered a lot of ground, but we're not quite done yet. We want to finish up by giving everyone another moment to pause and for you to create a next step for yourselves. And why? I think this quote says it beautifully. Knowledge about other cultures doesn't suffice for being interculturally effective. We also need to behave differently. So let's take this opportunity to create a next step or two that will help you behave differently and be more effective. So take a moment to pause and reflect on at least one action step and think about, you know, what's one thing you can stop doing, you can start doing or continue doing as a result of today. And, you know, we'd love for you to type it in the question so just we can see it. Um, we're curious. Um, but more importantly, please make sure to write it down somewhere or type it out for yourself so that you have that action step somewhere prominent where you can see it easily. Because if you look at it throughout the day, it's just a little reminder, but it really helps. All right, before we say goodbye, two quick things. First of all, please reach out and contact us with any questions. You can reach out to me if the question's about the webinar, the content, anything related to that, and you can see my email there, or visit our website at crownworldmobility.com to learn more about uh, upcoming webinars we have and other services. And then, this is really important to us, we really want to know how this webinar was for you. Um, so you can just hold your phone camera up to the QR code, and then um, when you take a picture, you'll get a link that um, you can click on to do a quick survey. It's really going to help us plan future events. And just so you know, if you can't do it using that QR code, we will send you a link um, to the survey in an email. Whew. All right, everyone, that's it. We hope these 30 minutes have been valuable and enjoyable for you. And on behalf of Sean and that's I, right. and the, there <laughs> you are, <laughs> and the crowning cultural training.com team, we really thank you for your participation and wish you all the very best as you thrive in the days and weeks to come. Thank you, Thanks everyone. Thanks so much, everyone. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.